does an ape man walk the uncharted forests of America's northwest? What unknown monster of the sea grappled with this US Navy frigate in South American waters? Why did people raise up this enormous circle of stones in Orkney 4,000 years ago? Who drew this giant, the largest figure in the world, on Chile's loneliest mountain? What hands fashioned the skull of doom? Does it bring death? Why do stones move by themselves in California's Death Valley? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. Mysteries have intrigued and amused me ever since I was a child and read stories of fishes falling from the heavens, of giant sea monsters attacking ships and luminous shapes moving through the skies. Over the years, I've classified them in order of strangeness as mysteries of the first, second, and third kinds. Even in this small island, there are extraordinary things on every side. 1,500 years ago, the king of Sri Lanka built this fantastic staircase. Why? We can only guess. This was a lost world for a 1,000 years. We may never know its purpose. What made a tyrant king create this palace with its pleasure gardens in the sky? For me, it's a starting point in a journey through our mysterious world. Here we are in the middle of India on a beautiful, bright, sunny day. Yet we're waiting for one of the most awe-inspiring phenomena that the whole natural world can show, a total eclipse of the sun. A splendid example of a mystery of the first kind. In a few minutes, this brightly lit landscape will become perfectly dark. But of course, this still terrifies many people, and indeed, even to a modern civilized man, it's quite an awe-inspiring experience. We know that the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but also 400 times further away. So by this very strange coincidence, the moon can almost exactly cover the sun at certain times of its orbit around the Earth, and that gives us a total eclipse. So this is a mystery which has been solved, yet at the same time, there are a good many scientific mysteries about the sun which have not been solved, which is why astronomers, as you see here, travel all around the world so they can observe this wonderful phenomenon, which is a great scientific interest. No, it's um, aluminium foil. Aluminium foil. Already the light on this landscape, which was so brilliantly illuminated half an hour ago by the full tropical sun, is fading to a sort of gray... Did you hear that? The cock crowing. The, the, already the animals know that something strange is happening. And in fact, the level of light here at the moment is something like that of Mars on a, uh, on a fairly bright day. And it, although it's quite cold now. I can feel when the wind blows. I feel as though I'm back in England. Less than a minute to go now, it's like a door closing with a great light behind it, a curved door hanging up there in the space. The moon has almost completely covered the sun. The last light is beginning to go. Just 
Just a tiny, narrow thread of light, that's all. I hear screams around me, people are scared of what's happening. As the landscape around us fades out. Only the very narrowest thread now. Just a few seconds left. It's going, 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 gone. Eye patches off. There is the corona, the most glorious sight. A great crown of light, the solar corona. There are streamers of light stretching out around it and very bright bursts of flame near the edge itself. It's still quite bright. We can see the landscape around us this man. as though it's probably a bright moonlight night as far as the illumination is concerned because the light from the corona is so intense. I can't see any other stars except Venus and, and little Mercury. Of course, the longer one looks, the more detail one sees. You can tell that there are enormous magnetic forces at play there because of the way these streamers follow lines, like lines of filing around a magnet. Now, you can just see the sun coming. It's, it's all ended. A burst of light, the diamond ring, so-called, just a single spot of light as the sun shines through one of the lunar valleys. It does it like a diamond ring in the sky. And now it's all over. That wonderful eclipse is what I call a mystery of the first kind. It was a mystery to our ancestors, but not to us. We know exactly how it was caused. Yet, tragically, millions of Indians failed to see it because they were terrified and stayed indoors and so missed the spectacle of a lifetime. We can enjoy an eclipse without fear, yet not without awe. However, this series is mostly about what I call mysteries of the second kind. There, we don't have the answers, though we may have many clues. The first example I'm going to give is a literally striking one. It took place on another beach in Scotland a few years ago. It was in 1966 that a terrifying visitation came to the beach cafe where Mrs. Jean Meldrum and her mother, Mrs. Evelyn Murdoch, were working. I looked up because I heard this noise getting louder and louder and there was like a, just like a ball of fire. It was like orange in the middle and it was luminous white round and it rolled right along the side of the cafe, when the, the wall in the cafe, and it came to the window and it came out the window. And I came up lifted up the way to have a look to see what this was and the thing came out the window and battered across the front of my chest and then it just, well it vanished because I picked the kid up and I went inside because everybody was panicking by this time. But I was sore for days after it and just there was nothing else to see after it had gone. But it was just like a big ball of fire. All of a sudden the whole kitchen that I was standing in just were lit up luminous white. I couldn't understand it, it was very frightening and then the people, the screaming went on till the, the beach was empty, the cafe, people had all run out the cafe. They ran out like lightning. And the beach attendant, who had a wooden leg, he usually sat on a table just next to the counter. And you never saw him move so quick in all your life. He was gone with the rest. And the following day, I discovered the two gas jets in the top of the cooker were cut right through. And we had to send it to the blacksmith in Creel, the local blacksmith, to be repaired. This man, Professor Roger Jennison, who's in charge of Kent University's radio telescope, collects such tales. Indeed, he's had such an experience himself on board Eastern Airlines Flight 539, coming into Washington one stormy night. Well, all of a sudden, just after one of the more intense crashes of lightning, there appeared from the pilot's compartment a most beautiful blue ball about the size of a football, near enough the size of a football, a lovely thing, which moved at a slow pace, about this sort of speed, down the aisle of the aircraft, a fast walking pace. I could certainly feel no sensation of, of heat, although it passed at arm's length from my face. I suppose it must have been a few seconds, I can't remember exactly how long thereafter, that the air hostess came clambering up the aisle. She flopped into my lap, she put her arms around my neck, and she said, did you see that St. Almost fire? 
Well, I tried to console her that it wasn't out St. Elmo's fire she'd seen. And St. Elmo's fire, by the way, are the beautiful corona that you see over the tops of the master ships and things like that. But this indeed was ball lightning. We'd indeed been very, very fortunate to see at very close core quarters ball lightning actually traveling down the middle of a screened aircraft. Ball lightning is still a major scientific mystery. In fact, until quite recently, many scientists refused to admit that it even existed. In the case of other mysteries of the second kind, we often have quite good films and photographs, yet we are still arguing about their interpretation. Does this film, shot in 1936, show the Loch Ness Monster? Did it surface once more 41 years later to be captured again by the camera? Is this the footprint of the Yeti, the abominable snowman of the Himalayas? And does this shaky film, taken in a forest in Northern California, really show Bigfoot, another ape man who has so far eluded all his pursuers? This strange light, which flew over southern England near Aylesbury, remains unidentified. But was it a spacecraft from another planet? This gruesome corpse was trawled up by fishermen in the South Pacific. Is it what it appears to be, an unknown monster of the sea? When the camera seems to capture an African snake twice as long as any ever recorded, or a missing link killed by explorers in South America, or an unknown species of big cat roaming the plains of Africa, can we believe the evidence the film conveys? Apart from the films and photographic evidence for these mysteries of the second kind, there are perplexed and often frightened eyewitnesses who'd like an answer just as much as I would. Gently. Water bailiff Alex Campbell reports he's seen the Loch Ness Monster 18 times. His closest encounter came one night as he rode in a boat with a policeman friend, Constable John Fraser. There was this terrific upsurge of water. Terrific. I knew right away what it was. But poor John Fraser didn't, and he was scared stiff. And he said, what in the name of heaven is that? Oh, I said, don't worry, John, it's OK. It'll be OK. I said, it's messy. Oh, that calmed him down a bit. But this surge kept going on. And then after what seemed to be two or three minutes, the surge still going on, we heard it breathing. And it was fantastic itself, that, because it was exact, sounded exactly like a horse that had been running, and it was sounded like this. <laughs> Just like that. This Belgian helicopter pilot, Colonel Remy van Leerder, was menaced by a gigantic snake. He was operating in the Congo. Now when I came down on that snake in his hole, on approaching it at the minimum speed, I would say, at 20, 25 miles, and I would say at about 25, 30 foot up, the snake raised up by about, I would say, 10 foot. And I could very clearly and closely see the head, which was looking, and I could not make a better comparison as with a very large horse, with big, very, very big jaws, looking triangular. And you're just standing up like that to me, and I, I feel and I'm convinced if, it, if, it, if I had been in its range, it would have struck at me, it would have been striking me. The Holmes family believe they came face to face with the legendary Serpent of the Sea. And we were going along, and all of a sudden we heard a disturbance in the water and saw this mound come up out of the water. Well, you've seen these motorway uh, tractor units with the very large tires, five feet in diameter, yeah. that sort of situation. But well, if you can imagine one of those being released, from below the water, and then shooting up it just under its own appear, propulsion. It? Yes, we we could see uh, that it had two shallow humps. Um, that were three or four feet long, um, and the then it had a small head. Like it had a, a had a thin neck and a small head, uh, which was was dipping in the water and looking around. What it was, we have never know. Never seen anything like it, it was, in our lives. It was, like, it was like some sort of prehistoric monster that, that you see. It's a huge <laughs> size, absolutely in huge, Jordan's incredible. Port, yeah. Yes. There's something very strange in the seas. And it's definitely there. Without any somewhere. doubt. It's a huge thing. 
Well, we've started to investigate some of these mysteries where a little work or logical deduction might help to solve them. Of course, where the evidence is lacking, they may remain mysteries of the second kind forever. The steamy airport at Palma Sur, set deep in banana country, near Costa Rica's border with Panama. Dr. Luis Gomez is director of Costa Rica's National Museum. He's flown in to hunt for any clue which might explain one of the world's most intractable mysteries, the giant stone balls of Costa Rica. Huge and uncannily perfect spheres, handmade and of unknown origin. They're even beside the airport runway. But Gomez's goal lies in the heart of the banana plantations, where an archaeologist has reported a new find. For 50 years since the giant stone balls were first brought to their attention, archaeologists have travelled here hopefully, but none has arrived at any explanation of their purpose or their date. In charge of this dig is Mike Snaskis. Hello, Mike. Wait. How are you? It's about time you're here. This is hard work. I imagine so in this heat. No, listen, uh, this is something. We found not only this one, which looks to be about the size of the one that's in the Palmar Airport, but also over here, about 100 yards, another large one. Right here, behind you, is still another. I think uh, it's been broken, but looks large as well. We probably have uh, the arrangement that we read about years ago of balls in line. There's absolutely nothing to tell who made the spheres or when or why. Bewildered archaeologists can merely clutch at straws. The fact that they are in lines uh, brings into my mind the possibility that they represent actual maps of constellations, for instance. Uh, that's my favorite theory, but uh, I don't know what... Uh, Mike? Mike, uh, what do you think uh, these stone balls were made for? Well, Luis, that's uh, it's a difficult question. Now, uh, I, as an archaeologist, should know better than anyone what these balls represent, and in fact, I know almost nothing. More than 1,500 giant stone balls have so far been found, the biggest eight feet across and weighing 16 tons. The granite they are made from has been brought from mountains many miles away. They are mathematically precise and must have taken years to grind down with nothing more than stone tools and abrasives. Today, they are the Costa Rican equivalent of the Garden Gnome. Dozens have been carried off to the capital, San Jose, to adorn important buildings. Others have been smashed by treasure hunters inspired by talk of hidden gold. But many still lie half buried in the jungle and banana groves where an unknown people placed them in a forgotten era. In half a century of painstaking work, not one real clue has emerged to explain the giant stone balls of Costa Rica. As you can see, we know nothing about the stone spheres. Uh, they remain and will remain for many years to come. A very true mystery. A few clues and a little logical deduction may, however, have helped this German scientist to find an astonishing explanation for another group of mysterious objects from the past. Dr. Arne Egebricht, director of the Hildesheim Museum, took us to Munich to an exhibition of treasures from ancient Iraq. There, modestly displayed, are three relics from old Baghdad. Dr. Egbrecht believes they prove that ancient people developed technology 2,000 years ahead of its time. These three curious objects were found in 1936 during excavations in Baghdad, in Iraq, and uh, they were found all together, one in the other, 
Now, here you have first of all a ceramic pot, and in this pot was put this copper cylinder, and in this copper cylinder, again, this iron rod was found on top and uh, on the bottom of this copper cylinder, uh, there was found bitumen. And if you take all these things together, this can only mean for a scientist that you have here an electric cell or a battery. The remarkable thing is that these objects are 2,200 years old. That means 2,000 years before electricity was invented in Europe, in Italy. In this experiment, part of an Iron Age fort is recreated in northern Scotland. Under test is an extraordinary claim that the ancient fort builders managed to produce almost incredible temperatures of more than a thousand degrees centigrade and so melt stones and turn them to impregnable glass. With American Richard Brinkerhoff, we walked on the very lintels of a great stone circle to investigate his theory that Stonehenge was an observatory. And the rude man of CERN may, after many centuries, yield up his true identity. Well, I think he's a Celtic god, really. A sex symbol. We did have one girl that was... Uh, been married for about seven years and uh, hadn't managed to have a child, so we told her to go and sit on the giant. Apparently, you're supposed to sit up there with your knickers off. I don't know whether she did that or not. But uh, the next spring, she was pregnant. I look at him every day. I think he is a sex symbol because he does uh, wonders for me. <laughs> the secret of who he is may lie in the soil beneath the turf from which the giant is cut. Our tests, using the latest scientific techniques, reveal that the giant, who looks like this today, may once have looked like this. The clue to his name and date lies in the line under his arm. A mystery of the third kind is something where we just haven't a clue. It's absolutely unaccountable. If they exist, psychic phenomena would be mysteries of the third kind. However, some events are so strange that they seem like mysteries of the third kind with no rational answers. But perhaps we can provide some clues. What would you think if this sort of thing happened to you? I was coming up this road. I was coming north. I was just about a block away when all of a sudden a fish fell right to my right hand, the left hand side of the car. I saw the fish, saw the fish fall out of the sky. And I kept driving. I was very amazed. And when I got here, at this location here, the yard was just absolutely covered with fish. And uh, I, I was amazed. I stopped. And just about that time, other people started, started getting here. And everybody was just amazed at the whole thing and just couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that the fish had just dropped out of the sky. We heard something thudding against the umbrella. And when we looked, to our amazement, it was a shower of frogs. And they still were coming from the skies. There were hundreds of them. Our umbrella was covered, all our shoulders were covered. And as we looked up, we could see them coming down like snowflakes. We happened to be in the dining room, first of all. We heard this terrific clatter. It was an awful noise, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> we rushed <coughs> out and um, went down into the garden, and presently a load of uh, broad bean seed came over. And we both ducked, <laughs> you ducked down because they're, they're fairly big, broad bean seed. And uh, then you got a little bit annoyed about it, didn't you? Well, I turned round to the wife and I said, well, this is bloody silly. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Looking around, we found they were in the middle of a shower of hazelnuts coming from the sky. And uh, they were dropping on the cars, falling in the gutter, and I should think there would be as many as we saw, about 350 of them. Which was very clear, and the sky was blue, and... Uh... There was one small cloud there, but there was no aeroplanes or anything like that about for them to come down from there. How they came and where they came from, I had no idea. But well, I had thought that it might be a vortex that sucked them up, but I don't know where you suck up hazelnuts in March. Our universe is such a strange and wonderful place that reality will always outrun the wildest imagination. <laughs>
Next week, The Monsters of the Deep.